thank you all for joining us tonight. I'll do a little bit of intro about me and, and hopefully that's establishing some of the, some of the credibility. Why, why pay attention to anything Brian says? So a bit about me, I've worked for 25 years in IT and with a focus in cybersecurity. And that includes a couple of kind of big jobs in healthcare. Most recently, I spent three years as vice president of cybersecurity at Anthem. Uh, hopefully you still like me because I worked for a big insurance company, but at, at Anthem, I led the team responsible for protecting healthcare data from hackers and other threats. And in particular, my team monitored criminal hacker activities on the internet, especially when health data was involved. And during that three years at Anthem, my team discovered more than 50 healthcare industry breaches just by monitoring for data up for sale on the criminal dark web. And I should mention, none of those were Anthem breaches. All, all the ones we discovered in those three years were breaches of other healthcare organizations, many of them provider, often small provider organizations. Uh, before that, if you go back a few years, I was the, the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer and Vice President of IT at Indiana University Health. And in that role, provided security guidance and leadership for our hospitals, clinics, and physician groups at IU Health. Currently, I'm an advisory CISO at a company called Trace3. We're a technology reseller, and we provide uh, technology services. The company's headquartered in California. I'm based in Indiana, and we serve customers nationwide. So my goal today is not to tell you about protecting businesses or hospitals or clinics as I would normally do in my day jobs, but my goal is to tell you something that I hope is worthwhile about your own personal cybersecurity risks. And as many of you are physicians, I have a theory, and that theory is that you've probably had all sorts of do this, don't do that kind of training before. Uh, it occurs to me as an, as an ex-hospital CISO that if you're a physician practicing at multiple facilities, you probably have to do multiple of those trainings per year just to be able to access systems in the different organizations. Um, but as the CISO of multiple organizations, I've been responsible for a lot of that training, and I'll be the first to tell you that it's usually pretty boring. And my goal today is to not be boring so I'm gonna tell you some stories about hackers and what they're after, what they want, what they like, what they don't like. And hopefully that will help you understand why you shouldn't do certain things or where you should do other things and that that will be worthwhile. And again, uh, if you have questions, we'll, we'll hit those for sure at the end. Now, usually we put conclusions at the end of an article or a presentation in the internet age I've learned put your conclusions up front maybe. And uh, I'm gonna show those to you right now. And if you're a person who trusts authority, like I just laid out, uh, you can just read this and trust me. And, and maybe you don't have to be here for the rest of the presentation because you'll just, hey, here's the stuff to do, I'm, I'm good. Uh, but if you're distrustful, and in this day and age, we should all be a little distrustful, I think. Um, I'm going to walk you through why these recommendations are the recommendations. And I won't read them to you right now. We'll cover some of these and we'll come back to them at the end. So let's start to launch into it. But first, before I introduce you to the five hackers we talked about on that first slide, I'm gonna quickly tell you three things you may or may not know that you should have as baseline knowledge about hackers or, or more technically cyber criminals. So there, one, there's a cyber crime market out there. Uh, very often when bad things happen, a group of people are behind it. We think about, and I'm gonna talk about these individual hackers, but realize that there is a very evolved market of highly specialized criminals out there who unfortunately are often good at what they do. And I'm gonna use credit cards as an example. If you've ever had a credit card stolen, maybe one person or one group of people steals a credit card from a website, a different group of people buy batches of credit cards and test those out to make sure they still work. A different person or group of people use those individual cards to buy stuff. A different group of people sell that stuff and turn it back into real money. There are multiple, multiple people. You could 
actually call it a market and an efficient market for criminal activity. Two, cybercrime is an enormous problem, probably much bigger than you realize. It generates more profit than the global drug trade. Let that sink in. If cybercrime was a country, it would be the third largest economy in the world. Cybercrime is only surpassed by the United States and China with the amount of money that it generates. And in this, in the year 2021, it's estimated that, that total damages for cybercrime are going to be around six trillion with a T, six trillion dollars. Uh, that's more per year than all of the national the natural disasters combined. And 2020, we know, is a particularly bad year. Uh, hospitals in particular, there was an explosion of ransomware in healthcare organizations. And in fact, we have the first recorded case of someone dying because of one of those cases, a woman in Dusseldorf, Germany, who needed urgent admission and had to be diverted when the hospital in her town was crippled by ransomware. Uh, a third thing to know about cybercrime is that you and I probably don't have an accurate, accurate awareness of our personal risk, how likely it is that we're to be taken in. Uh, some of the fallacies we think, I'm a small target, who cares about me? Or I don't really know that many people, maybe you do, but maybe I don't know anybody who's been a victim. Uh, Cybercrime is not well reported on, and when it is, it's lumped in with fraud statistics, but it seems that up to 16% of the people in the United States are victims every year. And that's keeping in mind, research indicates 75% of people don't admit to being the victim of something like this and don't report it. Uh, so if you think you don't know anyone who's been a victim, you're, you're, you're wrong. Okay, let's talk about the five aforementioned hackers. So I'm gonna tell you about these five people and, and introduce them to you, tell them, tell you a little bit about each of them. And so we're gonna start with someone I call Pierre, the password hacker. And so as a hacker, Pierre's particular skill is breaking into websites and stealing passwords and credit cards. Uh, very good at that. Now this is a totally made up example, but let's say Pierre broke into a website that was popular with physicians like, oh, Doximity. That'd be a good one. Uh, those passwords are very valuable, not just because of Doximity. If you use Doximity, you may know that your Doximity password can get you into, I think at last count, over 100 other websites tailored to physicians. So that'd be a really great target. And that list of passwords would be very valuable, would sell for a lot of money on, on those criminal forums. Now, again, Doximity hasn't had a breach that I'm aware of. Um, it's an artificial example. Pierre had software that he would use to test passwords that he stole from a website and, and run those against hundreds or thousands of other websites to see if I've used ABC123 exclamation mark is my password on this side. Try that same username and password or email and password at a bunch of other popular websites. So maybe that's your, also your Gmail. Uh, password or your Hotmail password or your Netflix password or your HBO password or your Hulu password. Each one of those has a financial value and can be sold for money. And uh, even if it's just a close uh, password, Pierre has that software that tests passwords. It can also tweak things automatically like the year 2020 can automatically be tried with 2021 or a month can be changed to a different month or the number one could be changed for the, to the number two, or the exclamation mark can be changed to a question mark. And so these collections of passwords, not just the one stolen, but all the other websites that it's valid for are, are sold in batches. And Pierre is a man of numbers. His business is a numbers business. So the more passwords he can put in his bundle for sale, the more product he has to sell. Uh, he doesn't care who you are, doesn't know much about you individually. Again, this is a numbers game. Um, the things that sort of make him unhappy are people who would have different passwords for each website because the common passwords, you know, one password stolen equals 100 products that I can sell essentially. 
but if that's passwords aren't common across different websites, you know that, that that's less valuable. And so, in terms of recommendations, you know what I think we learned from Pierre. One is use a unique password for every site. Now that if you don't use a password manager, will will verifiably sound crazy to you. How could I possibly? I, for example, I went and looked at my password manager, and I have about seven hundred. The internet's crazy, is and I have 700 usernames and passwords that I use. And about 10 years ago, I actually took the plunge as an early adopter, and they're all unique. And when one website is breached, I change that one password, and I don't worry about the other ones. And even you know some of the things about change your passwords frequently, I don't actually do that. Uh, the most current guidance is if you're using a pass, you know what what I get when I use a, a password manager, which is a piece of software that plugs into my web browser that I maybe have access to on my phone, that I don't have to worry about tracking all these different passwords. Um, Good options, uh, Keeper, I think uh, you're gonna get a discount code for, it, and it's a great one. Other products, Dashlane is a popular one. One Password, my personal favorite, is a piece of software called LastPass. They're all very good, and, and Keeper is great. And so that's Pierre and a little bit about him. I'm gonna introduce you to my second hacker, uh, who is Yelena. Now, uh, Yelena is a different kind of criminal actor. Yelena purchases, doesn't have the skills to break into the websites uh, or the interests, but she just purchases batches of passwords on the dark web, maybe from Pierre, uh, maybe from somebody else, and attempts to use that information to break into banking accounts or financial accounts. Unlike Pierre, Yelena will actually take some time to learn about you as an individual. And searching on social media postings, public databases, genealogy websites, all these are great ways to learn more about you and uh, to use some of that password information to figure out how to break into your accounts. Uh, some of the things Yelena loves, um, you know, certainly when you use the same password for multiple sites, that helps her too. Um, and she can, in that way, use account profile information from one site to answer security questions or to know more about how to get into a different website. Um, Yelena also really likes, sometimes your uh, password at a website is breached and you don't even know that. You, know, you may not know that seven years ago, LinkedIn lost all of their passwords, still are using the same one. Yelena would really like that because that's more time that she has to use those passwords that she purchases. Um, password reset questions are another thing that she takes some interest in. You may not realize, I, I think human nature is that when we have those, you know, what's your favorite color? What was the model of car you had? The, the questions you use to reset your passwords. Research tells us that 20% of the time we can figure out, someone who knows nothing about you can figure out your password reset question answers just by searching about you on the internet. And something that, that Yelena really likes that I did throw in here, uh, for example, is when you answer these fun games on social media. So um, maybe this rings a bell for you. Have you ever seen a game like this on Facebook or another social media site? You know, what's your soap opera name? And the way you're going to tell people what your soap opera name is, your middle name and the street you grew up on. Street you grew up on. Does that sound familiar? Oh, it's one of the most common password reset questions. So playing these games, your, your high school mascot, your, the, all these things can give people your password reset questions and thereby, again, think about it, enabling them to reset your password and log in to some of your uh, most sensitive accounts. Um, you know, some things that Yelena dislikes, definitely uh, two-factor authentication, uh, you know, having your username and password, but, you know, if, if she's trying to log in from a different computer, and she would be, she's not breaking into your, uh, your individual computer most of the time, she's trying to access from somebody else. Having two-factor authentication, so that's either you're getting texted another code, or you have an application on your phone that provides a code, or 
you know, uh, asks you to push a button when you log in. Any site where that's available as an option, consider turning it on, especially if there's sensitive information there you use or, or financial records. Something else just to think about and consider when you look at that, when you look at that password reset question, change your mindset from what's the easiest one on here? Like high school mascot is not a good security question answer one to pick, because think about it. I can probably figure out pretty easily which high school you went to. So try to pick the most unusual questions on the list. Some people, this is a little crazy, but some people even use fake answers to those questions. I, um, I get surprised every year. I have a fake birthday on the internet. So uh, on social media accounts, anywhere I'm asked for my birthday, I get a lot of birthday wishes on the July 1st every year, which is not my actual birthday. So again, strategies for Yelena, use two-factor authentication, pick less obvious password questions. These are good strategies for, for Yelena. Next, we're going to talk about Carl, Carl the Carter. Uh, Carl's particular specialty skill is that he likes to purchase batches of credit cards on the dark web, maybe from Pierre, maybe from somebody else. And Carl is really good at testing. So he'll buy a batch of a thousand credit cards. Very often, there's some percentage of that batch that he bought, um, which is stolen from some website or database somewhere on the internet. Uh, and some of those will be good and some of those won't. And Carl likes to figure out step one, which of those are good. And the way he'll often do that is test the credit card numbers by purchasing something small, usually like a website membership, something very inexpensive that he can purchase online. And he will run uh, thousands of those. Again, small transactions just to figure out which credit cards work. Um, Keep that in mind. You know, I hear this a lot of times. I've, I've heard people say, yeah, I always have, you know, every once in a while I have these strange charges on my card. I have no idea where they came from. I just ignore them. Um, it could be Carl, um, could very easily be Carl or somebody like Carl. In cases where those small purchases are successful, that's an indication to Carl that this is still a valid credit card. And uh, Carl may resell the credit card to some other criminal. As I mentioned, there is an economy of crime here. Or, um, you know, may use them himself, may, who knows where in the world Carl is. He may hire somebody on Craigslist to use the credit card for him in, in some sort of odd scheme. Um, he also will purchase identity information from you know, those username, passwords, and other breached information or gather databases of that kind of information to use to help. You know, sometimes websites require him to know a little more and validate a little more about individuals uh, to, to make those purchases. Um, sometimes the fraud prevention uh, technologies at different websites, like an e-commerce site, will trigger on, well, are you in the right city for, you know, are you in, you're buying this with Brian Quick's credit card. Are you in the same city as Brian Quick? Uh, Carl actually has access to websites where he can buy stolen, you know, hacked computers. He can use Aunt Sally's computer or maybe your office computer because it's in the same city as Brian Quick and do the purchasing from that computer so that the transaction comes through, that it's not triggered and stopped because, you know, Carl was in Latvia or, you know, somewhere else in the world and, and not where the credit card holder was. Carl likes when you, when you don't challenge the little charges on the credit card. Um, and um, Carl really dislikes people who have credit freezes at Equifax, Experian TransUnion. That's a good strategy there of, you know, don't, uh, you know, Carl will open new cards if he can, uh, if he has the information to do that. And so, so be aware of that. And so we talked to, you know, a reason to keep track of your credit card statements, keep your, keep your credit frozen. We'll talk about Alex, the malware. I think this is the kind of hacker people think about a lot. 
uh, someone who writes malware, we used to call these viruses. So interesting when, for those of us that work in uh, healthcare, uh, the viruses. Um, so, so Alex, the, the malware author, um, you know, Alex has, has definitely some computer skill and, and has a toolkit that he purchased on the internet and he can make uh, viruses on demand, uh, usually even before your antivirus software is, is updated for those viruses. Although, you know, usually it's not even worth the effort. Uh, a lot of people don't keep those things up to date and uh, he can be pretty effective with, you know, the stuff he was using last week or, or last month. A lot of times the things that, that Alex is looking for with malware, you know, he likes when people click on stuff. Uh, he likes people that are in a habit or in a hurry and, um, and like to open attachments and emails that come to them that aren't suspicious of, you know, going to a website that they're not familiar with. And so, the, and that's one of the most popular ways, well, you know, especially for individuals, the kind of things that are going to take you down most often are coming through email or, you know, through some uh, unusual website that we might visit. Uh, the goal here, you know, really increasingly, the thing Alex is looking for is, is really more passwords uh, in a lot of cases. And so, uh, and I get asked this question a lot, why, why a password manager, you know, I store my passwords in my Google web browser or, or my Firefox web browser and isn't that good enough. And the primary reason why that isn't a good practice, you know, why that's really a bad practice is that most malware these days, one of the first things that it's gonna do is go and pull, because those passwords are accessible to you on your computer, if you haven't ever seen that, if you're storing passwords in your browser, you can always go in and click and say, show me that. Uh, those, those passwords are easily accessible to any software running on your computer, including, including malware, including you know, what we would have called a computer virus. Um, you know, the things here, keep your operating system, your applications, your antivirus up to date. Um, this is one of these things I just notice, you know, and I, I pay attention to when I'm out to lunch with somebody, it's been a while since that was the case. It's, it's family members a lot of the times that there's a new update for iOS and it's just like, eh, I can't be troubled with that. The vast majority of the time uh, when there's an update, operating up to date on your phone, even, you know, and on your computer these days, most of those are security related. Those are the things that are changing on a frequent basis. So do keep those up to date. Do keep antivirus up to date and keep your applications on your mobile devices and on your computers up to date. And, you know, secondly, with a smiley face, just don't click on stuff uh, to the largest extent you can. And even here, you know, th this one's is is hard, but you know, we've seen in the last year the the people like Alex just get better and better at their at their craft. Uh, a lot of times when they break into somebody's email or have access to somebody's email and they're they're sending out uh, that they'll use replies to an existing thread of email. So if they look in your inbox and they see, you know, here are all the people you work with and there are 30 people on this, or, you know, if you're in some customer service role uh, at a company, you know, that they will reply to an existing thread with that virus they want people to open because people's mindset is just, oh, well, like this is another thing. Even if the message doesn't make sense, the attachment doesn't make sense. The thing that's being linked to doesn't make sense. Um, just always, this is, I always am in a habit of the, just take that, take one deep breath before I click on something. I've learned to be real skeptical of, wait, why am I, why am I clicking? Uh, you know, be willing to, to take a deep breath and look at it. And finally, oh, Hannah, I'm gonna tell you about Hannah, the scammer. And 
you know, scammers have been around since way before computers. Uh, the, the methods, the understanding of human psychology has been the same. And the thing that's, that's really changed or updated is the technology enablement, the, the techniques, how the old techniques can be brought into the digital age we live in. You know, Hannah as a scammer is someone who understands human psychology, takes advantage of emotional manipulation techniques to deceive her victims. Uh, Hannah might be somebody in your community who does actually know you, or Hannah might be somebody halfway around the world. There are a lot of people like Hannah uh, out there. If you've ever, you know, gotten an email from a Nigerian prince or a British lottery winner, or, you know, that that's the Hannah character, the Hannah mindset. Um, and Hannah, again, increasingly, you know, uses email or even more recently, text messages, connections on social media from people you think are somebody you know, or you think you're an old classmate, uh, but aren't. Um, phone calls, you know, actual calls on the phone, um, and, you know, fake websites, websites that look pretty similar to the real one, but aren't, are definitely a part of her repertoire. Um, she often knows something about where her victims work, worship, volunteer, or send their kids to school and takes advantage of those relationships or that built-in trust. Uh, school directories, church bulletins, email distribution lists uh, for different organizations are very helpful to Hannah in, in building those and manipulating those trusted relationship. And she likes to impersonate trusted people from those settings. Um, she's bold and thinks on her feet, targets businesses or individuals. And uh, Hannah will change her straight, you know, when something doesn't work for a few days, she'll try a new strategy and, you know, use that until it stops working and she'll try a new strategy after that. And often she'll take advantage of the seasons like, oh, is it, is it the end of the year and time for, you know, office parties? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll tailor something around that. Are people expecting COVID vaccine shots to be available soon? I'll take advantage of that in a scheme, uh, those sorts of things. Just a couple of her favorite scheme of her favorite scams, you know, sending you, hey, your account's been locked on this website, or your membership needs to be renewed for this thing that you have, or we've detected unusual activity, something similar to that, asking you to give her your username and password, uh, trying to take your your credit card on a fake site. Um, in small physician practices, any sort of change around billing, um, you know, that those are common schemes. Another one is a help me scheme, pretending to be a family member, a clergy member, and maybe a patient, maybe a coworker in an urgent situation, asking for a money transfer uh, under some unusual circumstance. Uh, pretending to be the government that you're in trouble with, the police, the FBI, the IRS, Medicare, Indiana Department of Health, um, you know, anything where there's a database and, you know, the, a threat of something bad's going to happen to you if you don't do this immediately. Um, Craigslist and eBay scans, deals that are too great on cars, electronics, heck, even medical equipment, and collecting money through unusual channels bank transfer scams, extortion, uh, convincing people she has access to their computer or mobile device and knows about the bad things that they've done. Um, Hannah likes people who are generally trusting and react to those emotional appeals. Hannah loves, loves, loves people who are too embarrassed or too busy to ask questions or to delay a decision until they can investigate it more without question Doctors, lawyers, and executives are some of her absolute favorite targets for that reason. Uh, Piana also is one who likes people who share a lot of information on social media. And Hannah dislikes people who are willing to slow down, confront authority, take a deep breath, don't expect something for nothing. 
here are a lot of scams out there. Just be aware of some of the common ones and always, always be willing to slow down, uh, especially, you know, when your money or when, when high stakes are involved, just take a deep breath, be willing to slow down. Okay, as I said, come back, here these are again, and you're all still here. Um, so I appreciate your time. Uh, the key recommendations, use unique passwords per website so they can't be stolen and reused, uh, resold across the multiple websites where you have access. And the only way you're gonna pull that off, uh, I can't remember 700 different passwords, you probably can't either. Um, use a secure password manager. Use two-factor authentication where you can, you know, get that code uh, to log into the website. Use the last common password reset questions. Keep operating systems, applications, and antivirus up to date. Learn about common scams. And this is a bonus. We didn't talk about this one. This would be the sixth hacker for a different day. But, you know, my bonus guidance is, is back up your data securely. And, um, you know, that th these will be, if you do these things, you'll be in better shape than probably 90% of people out there. Uh, and, you know, you'll be protected from, from some of their schemes. Um, I, I truly hope I accomplished my goal of telling you something interesting about these people. I hope you learned something new about the five hackers that will protect you. I'm happy to take questions, but I do have one final bit. Uh, these five personas do represent real bad guys and gals that my team tracked uh, at my last job. But, and so there are real criminals like this out there, but none of these five people are real. And when I say none of them are real, I mean that even these pictures you're looking at right now are not pictures of real people. These are not models. These pictures right here were created by an artificial intelligence uh, piece of software that used combinations of traits from millions of different pictures on the internet. They aren't models, they simply don't exist. And that's just one more thing to keep in mind when you're interacting with somebody on the internet. Uh, so with that little bit of joy, let's open it up to questions.